Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Give Me the Check podcast. I am your host, Freddie V. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, I am so happy because we have the producer perspective. When I say producer, I mean this man's got a catalog, y'all. He's got a catalog. Session guitar player for amazing acts like Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, David Gaeta, Taylor Parks, and one of my personal favorites, Victoria Monet. Hi, Victoria. How you doing? Please. And this guy right now, before I introduce him, you guys got to check out his new project called Child, man. He's a producer for that. They're putting out amazing music. Please, I want you guys to make some noise from your house for the one and only Pierre-Luc Rioux. What's up, bro? So happy to be here. Thanks thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for making it out, man. I really appreciate it. I'll go ahead and say it. I'm like putting these podcasts out in different order, but you are my first guest. So, man. Well, I'll try to uh, set the bar. Yeah, man. Let's set the bar. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. Let's get it popping. I'm going to have to have to start with your origin story. Some of my guests I know very well, but with you, I'm very excited because a lot of these answers, I don't know the answers to. There's questions I don't know the answers to. So, where were you born? Where were you raised? Where did it all start for you? So... I know this is like a Montreal-centric podcast. I mean, it's going out into the world, but I, I know we're, we're talking about the Montreal culture. So I'll go uh, OG here and I'll say that I was born in RDP. Oh, so <laughs> OG RDP. So yeah. no, I was born in Montreal, but I was uh, raised in uh, Rivière de Prairie. Yeah. Right on. So like, what is your first musical memory growing up in RDP? Like, I know for me, one of my first, like not even just touching an instrument, just one of my first musical memories was like, I think I was like two or three or something like that. It was like Thriller playing and I'd be freaked out by the music video. So I would hide behind the couch. So the music video would be playing and I'd be grooving behind the couch and every time I'd like look back, I'd be like, eh. you know? so that's what mine, like what is your first musical memory? So I would say, so I'm primarily, like I started out as a guitar player. So my first, the first thing that really like hit me was seeing Slash play in a stadium for uh, uh, the Appetite um, album, uh, and I was like, "This is exactly what I want to do for a living." Like this, I, I saw Slash running cro running across the stage, and uh, I completely blanked out on the name of the, of, <laughs> of the Guns N' Roses album. Mm -hmm. Is uh, whatever anyway oh, man, sweet child of mine like yeah. that that album um and uh and and yeah man it was it was see seeing him it was like larger than life and i thought this is exactly what i want to do for a living i want to run across the stage with forty thousand people singing songs but then the the why i brought up rdp and um why i thought that was that was like an interesting thing in my childhood is that I was also raised in, in, in like a pre predominantly black neighborhood. So I was also in contact with like the Wu-Tang Clan and Ooh. stuff like that kind of early on. And those two sounds in my household really didn't like connect. Like my dad had like knew nothing about hip hop, didn't want to know anything about hip hop. And so like when I was playing hockey, I was listening to like hip hop, my friends. And then when I was coming home, I was watching like Guns N' Roses with my dad and I don't know that I guess today I kind of like bridged those worlds a little bit um, with, with my guitar playing and some of the productions that, that, that we do that's a little more, more R&B leaning so it's like I guess that's my um, origin story. <laughs> that's really cool, man. That's and, and me like too that's that's something that you know I really went to the R&B direction myself and too but like growing up man one of the things that <laughs> got me into it was playing Green Day. Like I was like in seventh grade with the bass Dude. all the way down to my knees. With Same the pick. thing. Like rock and roll. Like just learning and starting in there with the music musicality and having that. It just serves every everything like in your life and other types of music as well too, man. When I saw Woodstock, uh, I guess it was '99 or whatever. Like the 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 second version of Woodstock. When I saw the Green Day concert. When I saw Billy Joe just catch the 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 patch of grass that yeah. somebody threw at him and ate it i was like this sounds like the coolest thing i've ever like it's just it, it i just couldn't believe that people did that for a living right <laughs> like that's his job and i that's that's what gave me the bug i mean 99 was a bit later uh i was playing guitar back then but even before that it's just like there's something about 
playing to a big group of people. I, that was always what the most intriguing thing for me. Yeah, man, it's like that same thing for me too. Rock and roll. That's what that's what really got me to think. Me was like living color as well too, and seeing these acts play these amazing stadiums and and just you see the energy, like from some of these rock acts. You know what I'm saying? That 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 came out. It was it was something that I really 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 wanted to do too because you know with hip hop and stuff, you would, some of the things that we'd see would be in smaller clubs, but some of these rock shows, you'd see these amphitheaters and things, and you'll see these type of stories where like um, they'll be like in Brazil or especially when they go to South America. You know those concerts are crazy 100,000 people and it's a storm everywhere but except on top of the stadium mm. just because the energy <laughs> in the stadium is so crazy but that it's like wow dude it's... today like the 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 R&B and hip hop acts are the rock stars of back in the day like exactly. the, the slash that I saw when I was a kid uh now it's like uh, two years ago I was at Oceaga and Travis Scott was playing and dude Travis Scott had just as much you know aura as mm -hmm. as slash it's just like a different thing but it's like and i remember he was late to the show oh so it's very like, rock star very <laughs> so it's like star. he was late and they were they were they kept showing like okay travis scott is coming whatever like in 10 minutes and people were like Wah. and i thought man i mean that's that's just like that that is the most exciting thing i think about music and about life it's just because you know when, when you record music you have like the the added bonus let's say of like details mm -hmm. so you can you can get really kind of detail oriented and you can hide stuff in it and like people listen with headphones and like they discover stuff with live to me i call it like the world of of the obvious mm -hmm. it's like you have to make things super loud and super in your face and the thing i like the most about that is that it's a one-time thing mm -hmm. and even if you capture it like on whatever uh, camera and like you put it on youtube it's just it ain't the same like if you show up and you're there for that one concert there's just something about like the the you know that that one moment that yeah. is just comes and go yep and for me it's like playing live i've never been able to get that feeling anywhere else in life like anywhere else the drugs uh, yep. sex <laughs> exactly. uh, name it it's just it's just <laughs> It's just not the same. Not I don't same. know, and that, that's just me. Maybe other like that's that's what's crazy about like um, that's what I love about Los Angeles mm -hmm. uh, because here we have a, a smaller industry, like a much smaller industry. Exactly. So there's a lot of people that do a lot of that have a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. Like oh, there's a guitar player that also does this and that, and there's mm -hmm. an engineer that also does whatever yeah. in LA there's a lot of people that are highly specialized exactly and I met this girl once and I thought she had the most incredible voice and she was probably the best writer I'd ever met mm -hmm. and I was like why don't you why don't you have a band or why don't you have a, like a solo career or why like why don't you sing for people to hear your voice and she's like I, I just really like to be a writer yep and I swear to God I had never that thought and never crossed my mind mm -hmm. that people just didn't have didn't want to play music live because that's literally all i wanted to do so yeah. i didn't i didn't think uh yeah i just I mean, maybe that's like uh egocentric or whatever but i and i never imagined somebody not liking live music yeah it's like even you know uh, i think summer walker as well too you know when she first came out i think there was a bit of a of a shock because the live experience for her was not something that she kind of came up in and she was like i, I kind of have to take a step back get used to it and whatnot and she really spoke about some of the difficulty and for us who kind of came up it's like wait, wait, what are you what, what are you talking <laughs> about like this is what we live for we're in the studio to get to this place like this is the <laughs> final frontier but it's funny and, and it's funny you say that about uh, los angeles too because um that's what you know i visited a couple of times and and that's what i realized too and it kind of gets hard to get into different things you know the writers are the writers the producers mm -hmm. are the producers the session cats are the session cats the live cats are the live cats and so us you know in the small industry since the industry is smaller here for me I, I've had to diversify my portfolio you know I started as a singer then you got to play bass then you got to produce then you got to do the podcast then you and that's how you that's how you survive you know what I'm saying by 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 multiplying your revenue there's so it's this, so different for us there's this guy that I love he's he's one of my whatever idols or whatever he's um 
I'm going to call him an author, but he's he's much more than that. He's, his name is Peter Diamantis, mm -hmm. and he's like a, a, a doctor that, you know, turned writer, turned uh, scientist, whatever. Long story short, he has this list of rules. He called it the Peter Peter's rules okay. or whatever. And they're very, like, contrarian rules, like stuff that you wouldn't be used to hearing. And one rule that I love, two rules. Uh, one is... Uh, whenever in doubt, take both. So I, <laughs> I love like that. It. It's like, oh, should I do a podcast or concentrate on my life career? Mm -hmm. Just do both. Right. Um, and and there's, he has another rule that says multiple endeavors, multiple successes. Amen. And sometimes, and, and don't get me wrong, I think it's super important to specialize. And part of why... I, I got to do whatever I do today is because I, I, I specialized mm -hmm. in something. Uh, but specialization, I think, is a function of time and effort and focus. Yep. So it's like, I think if you double down and like, you know, obviously you, you, you're going to maybe sacrifice other areas of your life, but you can specialize in multiple things. And mm -hmm. if you then go to the junction of multiple speci uh, specializations, mm -hmm. you can become unique. Like exactly. just the one guy or, or gal that is an expert at, like look at Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan is an expert in martial arts. He's a world-class stand-up comedian and a world-class po world, world podcaster. Mm -hmm. And so, there's no two Joe Rogans, you know? Yep. So I think, I don't know, man. As a musician, um, I started out as a, as, a, as a guitar player, but then I moved into production. And I think the combination of both m allowed me to, to, to work. Amazing. Oh, my <laughs> God. That is free game. I, that is free game right there, y'all. I really hope y'all took some notes on that. And we're going to talk about that transition, but let's talk about the beginning of actual that Got journey, you. which is your specialization, your first specialization, guitar. You know what I mean? So how did you get your chops up? What was your process? When did you pick it up? And like, how did you like kind of just jump into that pool of becoming like a bomb guitarist? All right. So are you a spiritual person? Yes, I am. Okay. So look, um, I am too, and there's something something I've never told anyone, and I'm I'm glad that uh, we're, we get to speak, or maybe I told my girlfriend, but like that's not something I, I really say like I talk a lot. But anyway, uh, about that. Mm -hmm. But so my chops, okay, few things. First of all, I was passionate about it, mm -hmm. really passionate, and um, there was this one time. And I'm going to get to the spiritual part. But there was this one time that I um, I was in Sija. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty good at guitar playing, but not like world class or anything. Mm -hmm. And then I heard this like guy playing from, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a room somewhere at Sija. I was like, this has got to be a recording because I never heard anyone, be, you know, play at that good. Right. I opened the door. And it was this guy, like metal looking guy, fucking just like totally in his stuff, like ripping, like shredding. And I'm sort of a competitive guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't, for, I, I wasn't competitive against him. I, it's, it's more like a thing, mm -hmm. like an, being competitive with myself. But like, yeah, I introduced myself. I, I, I said, you know, I've never seen this before. Like, you're, <laughs> like that's incredible. And then I, I said, all right, well, have a nice day. Mm -hmm. Closed the door. And I said, that's never going to happen again. You went home, didn't you? I, I went closed home the door. And <laughs> I, had this, I had this, this, this tape called Rock Discipline from jo John Petrucci, who was the guitar player for Dream Theater. Because right. back in the day, when, I think that's true for every musician. When you learn your instrument, you, there's a part, I don't know, I say every musician. It was true for me. Uh, there was a part where I really got into the virtuoso players. Right. John Petrucci being one of them. Mm -hmm. I think to this day, he created the best video for learning guitar. For technique. Not soulful playing or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Just pure technique. And I put the video on. I practiced it every day 
every every free every time I had free time, I had the video on and I was playing. Even if I was what or let's say I was watching a show, I was doing the exercises. I was like just constantly just wanting to get over that hump. The spiritual part is that um, I don't know. I I always had a connection with spirituality and back in my youth Christianity and I'm sort of not so sure anymore anyways whatever I might have fallen off it's a journey man it's a journey man <laughs> <laughs> but um back when I was a younger kid I was more of a practicing Christian mm -hmm. whatever and there was this one like piece that I was trying to learn is, is a Steve Vai song, like mm -hmm. super technical, virtuoso, whatever, guitar player. Mm -hmm. And like, I was practicing it, couldn't make it happen, practicing it, couldn't make it happen. And I put it down and I went to bed and the next day, I, or a few days later, whatever, I, I don't know, I just, and that, that might sound ridiculous, but I felt something. I opened it, I played it, and I could play it, I didn't practice it more or in the, so maybe there was like some uh, subconscious thing happening or whatever in my brain. I figured it out without practicing. Who knows? But after that day, I saw my guitar, or saw, I felt my guitar playing just like exponentially grow. And I always attributed it to something spiritual, I, spiritual because I never, it's not like I put more effort. It just, it, it, it came. And, um, I don't know, man. That was a, you know, you, I think we all have those experiences where something happens, you can't explain it, and you just kind of roll with it. That was one of them, and uh, here I am. And it's, I, I feel weird even talking about it because there's no real man, <laughs> rhyme it, or reason. I, I am, you won't, I'm so with you right now. Like, I have goosebumps. I, just to tell you, you do not sound ridiculous. That's what it is. I've had similar experiences like that too, whether it's, you know, when you're about to find your way learning a song, um, just as coming up as a musician, a, a contract as a professional musician, and you have this barrier and you know you can't play, and then what's the thing that unlocks is kind of this spiritual thing you're going to bed to it. I'll tell you this story very quickly, and I, just to, to show you that you're not crazy as much about, <laughs> I was listening to um, uh, the Questlove podcast and Jimmy Jam. Uh, 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 Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, the guys who produced, uh, who were there with Prince before, and then they produced for the SOS band, and then afterwards they went on to produce Janet Jackson and Boyz II and everything, and New Jack, all, all of that. So Jimmy Jam was saying that he was in rehearsal with Prince, because Prince was producing the group The Time, right? And so Jimmy Jam was playing keys and playing, and um, they're playing this like incredible funk song, uh, 777-9311, right? complicated though but the keyboard part's not is, is not that crazy so he's doing it keyboard part with the bass in the left hand boom 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 he's cool prince is like jimmy what are you doing with your right hand he's like there's nothing else in the track he's like it has to be bigger than the record play it play, uh, play some strings with your left hand okay all right cool uh jimmy there's a microphone you're not singing what are you singing he's like all the harmonies are taking what, do, what else do you want me to do he's like sing find a note Go, all right, cool. Do, seven, 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 nine, eight, three. Do, 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 do. And he's like, all right, cool, cool. So he's starting to sweat, right? Crazy. And then after he's like, okay, um, say, Jimmy, you're standing still. Do the dance steps. He's like, I'm not a dancer, bro. You didn't hire me for this. Come on, man. He's just like, it has to be bigger than the record. Come on, dance. And he has to do the choreography. And that's when he started getting frustrated because it didn't come in. Do, 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 do. Eh, seven, seven, eh. He's like, fuck. He went, yo, he couldn't get it. Chris was like, you better come back tomorrow and make it happy. He couldn't get it. He went home. He was trying it through a chair. I mean, frustration because just he had to split his body into five and all that. And then he was just like, and he just put it down and he walked away from it. And he thought about it in his mind and he played it in his mind and he kind of just fell asleep to it. He woke up the next day. Could do it. Got to the room. <laughs> I'm talking full swag, dude. Funk face. Boom, 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 boom. Seven, 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 nine, three. Picking up all these weird harmonies, swagging out, taking, having time to take out his handkerchief. And he was just like, I had an overnight spiritual experience, which allowed my mind to let go of the things that are terrestrial. Crazy. And to open up and have my spirit open up so that I may absorb it because I, there was a block. There was a block, there was a block, and it's, and it's you have to get out of your mind at some moments. And that's where I'm like, man, sometimes you don't choose music, music chooses you. You know what I mean? And <laughs> I that's was, the beauty of it. I was part of a, an African band 
once and um it was split up in two it was like because it was here so it's like there's a bunch of like traditional african players mm -hmm. and a bunch of white guys mm -hmm. <laughs> and the white guys uh i was part of the white guys and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh I w you know it's like i can play the parts but i'm not a traditional african musician mm -hmm. like I've, i haven't i wasn't born into it mm -hmm. so at one point i didn't have a part and uh i asked the traditional guy so mm -hmm. like uh, you know i don't have a part in this part which what am i supposed to do mm -hmm. he's like well you dance <laughs> i thought that was so cool <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly man it's got to do something man so yo um so when you picked up guitar talking about you know really learning some of the virtuosos you know you did your homework on the technical tip had a spiritual experience <laughs> so was it after that spiritual experience that you were just like all right this is me this is my life like this is what this is like when did it click for you that you're like all right i'm all going right. I'm, I'm going 100 Another another uh, life changing moment that hopefully uh, will do for anyone listening the same that it did for me. Uh, no, it it wasn't at that time because I was I was a lot younger at that time and you know whatever I was um, I was passionate about it. Mm -hmm. I I saw dude running on stage. That's what I want to do. But you know I was also my my dream as a kid was to become a veterinarian. Like, I, I love animals, and I wanted to be an animal doctor. You know I like that. <laughs> and, like, I, you know, I was good in science, whatever, and I thought, you know, let me go and do that. And I also like to run my mouth a lot. So I was like, <laughs> maybe I can be a, a, a lawyer, whatever. And then there was this teacher that he wasn't even talking to me. He was talking to the class. Uh, but he said, there's this Greek philosopher, blanking out on name again, but that said you should do in society what you will bring the biggest contribution to society. Like, you, you should b basically choose your path based on the contribution you can do to society. And at that point, it was like, well, from, it's obvious that it's music. Wow. Uh, it, it wasn't even like um, uh, an issue. It, it was obvious. I'm like, I know that I can, the biggest gift that I can... The biggest, uh, let's let's say, upside mm -hmm. for others mm -hmm. is if I share that. Amen. Um, so that I, I chose on that day to become a musician, and then it was a really long journey because you know, as you know, uh, especially I, I I'm not from a musical family. Mm -hmm. None of my parents play music. None of my uncles play music. None of no one plays music, and no one no one has any contact in the music industry. And so I started from literally zero. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, learn from scratch, basically. And, like, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's how I chose to start the path of becoming a musician. That something else is beautiful, too. Man. <laughs> I, I, I feel the spirit, bro. <laughs> I really feel the spirit because that's, you know, that's what I try to tell, like, artists right now, you know, and they're like, I don't know what I want to say or my project or my thing and that, and we're kind of on ourselves. And, 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 and you... And let's be real, like we need a we need a, a certain amount of ego to be able to get over ourselves to get on a stage and to do something and to Absolutely. present it. You know, there is a part of it that's then necessary. But to make sure that you're not wrapped in that part, what I kind of tell the artists that are on the come up that we're working together or in projects where we're doing lyrics and things like that, it's like, what are you about? What's your story? All that type of stuff. And it's like, what do you have to offer? What do you have to offer people? What do you have to offer society? What can you do to contribute? And to make, but so once you start seeing it like that in that light as an artist, and that an artist is in service to society, an artist is 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 giving, you know, and to be a giver and not a receiver. And as soon as you may have that mental switch and saying that I have something to offer to society and I am in service of others, just like anybody that does community service, anybody that does anything, I'm doing things for people and whatnot. I find that that is like one of the purest intentions of music you know what i'm saying and so have hearing you say that just completely validates it i i think uh one of the most important i mean i think that's true for anything in life Ooh. but in music specifically it's being able to pick talent and being able to identify what people are good at mm -hmm. especially when you're a producer yep um and honestly that's how child got created uh 
Yanni and I, shout out to Yanni. Um, Yanni and I were, we, we met uh, kind of totally in passing. Mm -hmm. Like he was in Montreal, I was in Montreal, but he was on his way back to LA because he just got his visa. Okay. He literally, uh, we, we spoke like over Facebook, like real quick, like, do you want to do a session? Mm -hmm. We did a couple of, of jams and like a lot of them starting getting like attention, like kind of right away, mm -hmm. like super fast. And then he left to LA and I was going to LA maybe like six months later, mm -hmm. but we kept in contact and we've been in contact like ever since. And so at first we were a production team. Mm -hmm. We still are, but I mean, at first we were just like producers mm. and we we're producing for other people and we, we, we got a bunch of stuff done. But every time we were in sessions, I was like, I always thought he was the best like top liner in the room, but he wasn't there to top line. But, but I, I thought, man, like, I don't know. I think you're a really great top liner. Mm -hmm. And then he started cutting the top line. I thought, damn, you're actually a pretty you good singer. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, why don't we try to capture that for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And plus, another thing that, 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 that I had realized at that time was that we were, uh, and no knock on anybody else because everybody takes their, their own decisions, mm -hmm. but I thought we were giving ideas to people that were really good and they, were, they weren't necessarily using them in the way that, I, that we thought was the best ways, mm -hmm. you know? Or, or let's say we were doing a song and then it wouldn't come out for like two years. And then people were, I wouldn't say catching up, but it's like, it's, it's, it's always like a, whenever you have an idea, you have to assume that there's like a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 other people that got the same idea at mm -hmm. the same time. Like your ideas aren't unique. Right. <laughs> Everybody is getting those ideas. Tell it. And it's like, especially when you're an artist or a producer or whatever, your job is to have your finger on the pulse mm -hmm. and so you can't assume that you're the only one with the finger on the pulse so basically when you get an idea and you do a song you have to put it out because mm -hmm. other people are going to put out songs that are going to sound alike or whatever yep. so uh we were let's say doing these writing sessions and stuff and songs songs weren't coming out or they were coming out but like two three years down the line sometimes four years after and so i was like man why don't we try to capture that value for ourselves and just like try to put some stuff out into the world that is there's our own and plus we can take more creative risks and if we fail then what are we really losing like uh, you know we, we you can't really fail at putting out music and if people don't like it they don't like it mm -hmm. whatever you tried and if they like it that's amazing yeah and so here we are that's amazing so let's go ahead and talk about the, the transition <laughs> into child into child i love um how you de describe your sound uh and even the title of the record, you know, R&B, like I said, this podcast, I really want to kind of feature artists that are contributing to the culture of R&B from Montreal. And this is something that, you know, here, that vocabulary, the the phrases, all of that, but, you know, the, the diversity of R&B. R&B is so diverse. You know, you have classic, you have traditional, you know, you have a contemporary, you have alternative, and there's just such a gamut, I find, of R&B. And you guys came out with a term, and the name, I believe, of the record is synthetic soul. Can you explain some of that and what that means to you and how... I find that that really describes very well like the soundscape. Amazing. Of the I'm so you know happy you said yeah, that. For real. So I want you to talk a little bit about that and let the audience know what Synthetic Soul is all about. First of all, thank you. Uh, much appreciated. What Synthetic Soul means to us was um, a cl not a clash, a, a melting pot of old and new. Ooh. Now, that idea isn't new in itself, mm -hmm. but it's really in the choices of sounds. Like basically, we have this song called Count Me Out mm -hmm. in, you know, on the first record. And what we wanted to pay homage to was the big Sam Cooke um, string intros, yeah. you know, like the big. So we thought, let's make one of our own. Uh, but in that song, we took the vocal and we really kind of flipped it like super modern, mm -hmm. you know. So it's like we had this string sort of homage to 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 you know uh, sam cook and like we had the six eight feel but we also had like a really really modern take 
or our version of a modern take on, on vocal. And, you know, the, the guitar sounds were also, you know, very forward and, and a bit different and stuff. And so for us, Synthetic Soul is to try to capture some of the authenticity of, of, of the, the R&B sound, mm -hmm. but really kind of like distort it or put something like super new on it. Mm -hmm. And um, so there was this yeah song called Count Me Out. We have a new project out right now. Well, actually, no, it's coming out mm -hmm. this summer, but we have we started rolling out some songs. And there's this one song uh, that just came out uh, last, uh, t fr two Fridays ago, mm -hmm. called Awake with Mahalia. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Mah Mahalia and Ari, who uh, also contributed mm -hmm. from London. Also, Jay Warner. You know, okay, so... This Yo, Ari. Oh, shout out to Ari, man. Damn, pen game is ridiculous, man. Oh, okay. So pen, you guys know each other. Pen, no, we don't. I don't know. Uh, one day. But like, <laughs> man, pen game is ridiculous. I love I love what he did for um for Ketra, Gold Link. Bro. And uh, that, that, that record for me. Mina Lai, Mina Lai. <laughs> oh, my. No Vexo, man. That's my track. Yo. Okay. Shout out to Ari. You're a beast. So we have a super close relationship with London um, because when we... Okay, so here's like two really quick stories. Mm -hmm. First story, uh, child didn't exist at the time, or it was just like kind of we 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 went to London to do a writing trip. Actually, we went in Europe, mm -hmm. different places. Ended up in London, booked some sessions, and those sessions got canceled oh. last minute. But we had booked a studio, it booked like you know paying for the room and mm -hmm. stuff. So first day, sessions canceled. We're like, ah, you know, whatever. We're in London. That's cool. No big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just going to go walk around and shop and come back. Second day, sessions canceled. We're like, God damn, this studio is starting to get expensive. And uh, I was messing around with some drums and stuff. And, and, and Yanni uh, said, don't count me out. Cause I'll come back swinging. And that's, a, that, that's the line from, from count me out. So the child project, the way I see it, really started out that day in London. Now, we did another trip mm -hmm. back in London uh, in 2019. We were touring Europe, and we said, why not go back to London, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll do it again. Who knows? And then we booked some sessions, and then Jay Warner, who's a dear friend and an amazing writer and singer, came through. And he started laying out, laying out some vocals and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And that song became Awake, which is our first release for for for, for our next project. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, man, I mean, it's it's just, I mean, I'm definitely going to go back to London for this third record because man. it's I, we just have this special connection. So yeah, shout out to, to Jay, shout out to Ari, Mahalia, uh, and everybody else that's on the record, uh, D-Mile, mm -hmm. uh, Laid down some some of his magic. Um, we have this amazing Vina player. Okay, so that's another part of the synthetic soul sound that we like. Mm -hmm. So we have this R and B track, but then we took uh, this girl Abby Sampa. Mm -hmm. She's a Vina player. Vina is like an Indian instrument. Okay. It's like a weirdo guitar thing, mm -hmm. sitar. I don't even know how to describe it, but it sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, so why don't you play a solo of that over this R and B track? And so, wow. yeah, so it's kind of cool. So, anyways, she's on there. Uh, Max Belavance, uh, our our boy from Montreal. Shout out to Max Belavance and the Brooks. Alan Prater's coming here soon, by the way. Max, miss you, boy. <laughs> so he's playing drums. We have strings from Peter Lee Johnson, who is literally killing the game in Los Angeles. I think he's, made, he's, he's recording strings for literally everyone on earth. Uh, he's, he's, he's incredibly good. And um, yeah, man, I'm really, I really hope I'm not forgetting anyone. But anyways, I'm, I'm super grateful about everything that's happening. And, and I really like, you know, this last song, Awake. So you guys go check it out. Yeah, man, Awake is, Awake is, is, is hitting me right there. <laughs> like, Awake is probably my favorite so far. Yeah, I, have to, I, I gotta say, Awake is dope. And, and I'm so cool to see. I didn't know Ari actually was uh, penning in that the connection that child has with London because that's actually a bridge that I'm really trying to connect. You know, one of the artists that I had the pleasure of working with, it's probably the biggest artist I've ever worked with, you know, is actually from London. He's like one of the like legacy founders of the, the neo soul movement in London. His wow. name is Omar. 
Omar Lifehook and um, wow. like back in 92 he had this track called um, There's Something Like This and then every time that like you know India Irie Erica Badu Angie Stone Stevie Wonder Common all these the people that were there that would go to London he would do their shows and then he would come to the States and then he would do the show for them wow. so he was on Common's Electric Circus and so he's really like the neo soul OG of of London when it comes to like that entire scene and even right now he's definitely stepping up into his like legacy status he's getting lifetime achievement awards but i just find that north america has never given him his flowers and has, he hasn't really done the full continent and like right before the pandemic i was so close to getting him in his first date here to start in montreal so he can do the rest of north america after he got that lifetime achievement award because people are starting to understand toronto is on omar other people know but you know I find that, you know, when it comes to London, sometimes we need stronger bridges there. So I'm happy that you're one of those people who are like strengthening mm. the musical My bridge to, to, to London. Cause like LA, Montreal, London, like those three cities right there, man, like is the, I, I see now, I really understand like just the kind of like the ecosystem that you, that you got going on around your project is beautiful, man. Yeah. It's really around those three cities. Um, definitely. My goal has always been so growing up I was a French Canadian kid uh, and I was always told uh, you know sounding Canadian isn't a good thing mm. uh, America's got it figured out mm -hmm. <laughs> so don't bother and um, I always wanted to create I first of all I never believed in that and I, I always thought like okay so there's hockey players here that play across America why can't there be guitar players? Ooh. Like, to me, that doesn't make any sense. It's right. like, it, it's just, it's just a question of creating that bridge, exactly. creating that, that connection. There's a hockey league uh, that allows players from Canada, from Montreal, that grew up, uh, you know, over here to to, to play over there, make, mm -hmm. make millions of dollars, and have millions of fans. Why can't we have that for artists? And obviously, there there are some artists that have done it, mm -hmm. but it was always like kind of a anyways there, there was a, a stigma around you know sounding canadian mm -hmm. now that has changed oh yes quite a bit uh but i still would love to uh have geography not to be an issue between montreal and when i say montreal it's like the greater the gma yeah montreal slash just just Let's say Quebec, for, yeah. for lack of a better word. Um, I, I'd like to, geography not to be an issue between creators here and creators in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I th still think there's gaps in what people do here uh, because and it's specialization. Mm -hmm. and, but that's changing. But anyways, man, I, that's, that's one of my goals. That's, and that's a perfect segue into what I want to get to. Thank you so much for that transition. You're, you're a professional. You, you've done this before. But yeah, man, Canadian R&B. Like Canadian music, I think you just really explained that very well. But let's talk specifically about Canadian R&B. Canadian R&B as we know it in the nation is on the rise. You know what I'm saying? You see Daniel Caesar, Alicia Cara, you know, even the R&B pop R&B, all these different types of acts. Just quick 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 it. thing about daniel caesar and i got to give i got to give so much respect to matt burnett mm -hmm. uh, matt burnett i met in 2014 in toronto and you know we i don't see him quite quite as as often as I, I i wish i would but he's an incredible producer and he was he produced like eminem songs and stuff like the gigantic records right Ooh. and he told yanni that he always had a feeling that, uh, you know, he could do bigger and better. And I, I was like, you know, bigger than Eminem <laughs> fucking worldwide hit. But uh, he, the, he, him and his partner, Evan, uh, I think it's Evan, pretty sure. Anyways, I know Matt a little more. But uh, they found that this guy, Daniel Caesar, uh, they, and they developed him and they, they broke his career and now uh he's like a a major fixture of r&b worldwide but a product product of canada and you know m major shout out to da daniel caesar but major shout out to matt burnett who 
made it happen. That's dope. Thank you for saying that because these are the this is the type of info and the type of game that I want people to listen to this podcast to to know really who are the players and who are the people behind the scenes. Because yeah, I find that he is responsible. I think he by making that move, he really bust the, the door open. You know what I'm saying? Like pretty wide, and there's there's a lot coming out of it. And so that's a, you know on on the national scale, Montreal right now is really bubbling with a lot of emerging R&B artists. Not just, you know, we're known for our producers, we're known for our DJs, we're known for stuff like that, but as of right now, they're acts that are coming out and artists and it's really bubbling, you know, okay players starting to put out their, you know, list of top 10 Montreal R&B artists and whatnot. And so the city's on the map, but, you know, we find ourselves in the province of Quebec, which is very different from the rest of the nation. And, you know, one of the things that I'm going to scream on this project, on this podcast, and, you know, et, et je sais que ça va, il y a des gens qui uh, sont pas contents avec moi quand je le dis, I'm sorry, but I'm just stating a fact. I'm going to say it, the category of R&B does not exist in Quebec. I repeat, the category of R&B does not exist in Quebec. So I think somebody like you, who really understands like at like 360 the cultural um borders and divides you know what i mean uh between the states industry the Amer the canadian industry the quebec industry and how particular that is compared to the uk and whatnot what are your thoughts on like the state of r b and this like current really like this dilemma this situation we find ourselves in where the creation of it is a hot bed but where we are right now in this location, that there's literally no platform for the genre. The genre doesn't exist. Everything that we're getting is from outside of Quebec. All of our opportunities are coming from outside. But where we live, the genre doesn't exist. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. <laughs> this is going to be a real answer. No, no, no. <laughs> Let's but... go. <laughs> It's a complex problem. It's a complex, it's a complex thing because I want people from outside and inside to, and to get the phenomenon. I'm, I might not have the answer that you're expecting or that you're looking for. I don't know what you're expecting. I'm actually. A, I, just whatever. So, your, so your, your I, 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 I don't want to assume. And I think it's a multi layered problem. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to be clear or whatever. Okay. First of all, I, okay. Relating back to me or my experience mm -hmm. right uh, just cuz um, it's 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 a societal problem mm -hmm. but i'm going to talk about my own experience because i'm also part of an r&b project right so i've never fit in anywhere socially <laughs> i'm awkward and i think that's part of why i really like playing music live and you know uh, i really like oral presentations in high school because this gives me a chance to actually speak um, and express myself. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of standoffish in real life. Relating back to the R&B problem, I don't think that R&B or any style of music needs to fit anywhere. And the thing is, you're saying R&B doesn't have a category in Quebec. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure dubstep has a category in Quebec either. No. Nope. Or I'm not sure. I don't think that there's. I think there's more styles of music that don't have categories that styles of music that do. For sure. And so I think it's okay. And so, first of all, relating to my experience, I never fit anywhere. So I don't feel the need to fit. Got it. In 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 a mold of a category. Mm -hmm. And second thing, I've never won. I've never done music to win prizes. Mm -hmm. I've never done music to being to to, to get an award mm -hmm. or to get people to tap me on the back saying good job. Mm -hmm. I've I've done music to make a living, to tour the world, to play for genuine fans, mm -hmm. and to put put out music and put out ideas into the world that I think are good and mm -hmm. hopefully start a dialogue with people that agree with me mm -hmm. or us in the case of child. So for R&B in Quebec, my genuine opinion is that not having a category is a huge opportunity. Uh, I think people, because first of all, there's traditional mediums mm -hmm. such as 
commercial radio and commercial TV. Mm-hmm. However, uh, I have a Spotify artist account, right? Because mm-hmm. we have a, a, an account on Spotify and we put out music. So I can see our demographic. Mm-hmm. And our demographic is leaning, it's almost 50-50 uh, male-female, leaning a bit more female. And between the age, ages of 18 to, I think, 30 or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. just, you know, that sort of, in the tw- all, all the, the, the 20s, right? Mm-hmm. And my, my, my thought is that none of those people listen to tra- traditional med- media. Mm-hmm. None of those people listen to commercial radio. Mm-hmm. And most of them don't listen to commercial TV. Mm-hmm. They all listen to Spotify and Apple Music and all the, the DSPs. Mm-hmm. And they consume TV on YouTube, Netflix, and Amazon and whatever. Mm-hmm. So I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I would love for my yeah. music to be played on commercial TV and commercial radio everywhere in the world and for every other R&B artist from Montreal to be the same. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day... Um, I think if if you want to make an impact with 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 uh, an audience, mm-hmm. you need to make a product that is differentiated, mm-hmm. put it out, mm-hmm. and try to grow an audience. No doubt. And whether or not you have a category shouldn't be an issue because mm-hmm. I think it's actually good not to fit in a, into a category. Mm-hmm. Um, my own two cents. Uh, and and. I think the problem is, let's say uh, you have Le Gala de la Disque mm-hmm. or Le Gala des Gémeaux. Right. While Gémeaux is more like TV leaning and stuff, and so, and I don't think music has such a big part in the in in the on air mm-hmm. uh, version. But let's say let's say la Disque, right? So they have an on air gala mm-hmm. that awards mu- uh, like artists, and therefore people watch that and people become aware of these artists. When they watch it, and then th- these artists can like then accelerate their career with other types of media through that platform. Mm-hmm. That is a great thing, yeah. and that's been uh, I guess incredibly great for Der Freier and oh, yeah. <laughs> all these other acts. Uh, and so yeah, it would be great maybe if there was a category, but then at the end of the day. That those those award shows aren't really watched by people that consume our music. Oh, that's for sure. That's so, for sure. So I think the larger problem. Mm-hmm. Let's say we want to talk like ideas or societal issues, mm-hmm. is that there aren't enough commercial platforms that are geared to towards uh, young people. Mm-hmm. It, they're all geared t- towards. 50 and up or That's the source. And <laughs> whatever whatever that may be. So so then I'm not surprised that there's no categories because I don't think that anyone that watches this thing would even care about a category. Mm-hmm. No, for sure, I, I mean, man. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? Man, me, my thoughts is, is like, it's right. Like saying the word is like having an R&B category, we go uh, immediately to awards and things like that. And I'm so happy that you said what you said because when you're here building your music somewhere and you feel that, you know, and this is, and this is something I want to say, this is beyond race. This is beyond thing. It's, it's, it's a culture. You know what I'm saying? Like rhythm and blues is a culture. So when you're operating in a space where you feel like you don't have any representation in music, in, in, in life, in any aspect of life, it's a bit more difficult. So I really want to thank you for saying that perspective well, because it's sometimes okay. we forget that as we're operating because we're operating somewhere we're surrounded by some place where we lack representation. You know what I mean? Okay, well, wait. Very, very important disclaimer to, mm-hmm. to anyone watching. Uh, I am not in the least saying that I can relate to what it's like to be a black musician I got or a that. black like understood. I'm talking about my own experience. I under- understood. And and I understand that there's uh, minority groups that feel uh, underrepresented in in most of the, mm-hmm. the 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 let's say mainstream media and therefore when they see that their types of music or I don't even want to call it their type of music. I don't even know mm-hmm. like I want to be politically correct yeah, yeah. but like when they see that R and B, which is a style of music that they make, mm-hmm. isn't represented, mm-hmm. they might feel a connection between the fact that they're 
music isn't res represented and they're they're not represented in government or in whatever like other mm -hmm. like i'm just talking about r&b as as a, as a style mm -hmm. and quebec as a region mm -hmm. uh if if we want to bring the racial or or minority element mm -hmm. to the discussion then i mean that's that's a whole nother um because i'm trying not to cut you off but i'm trying i'm trying to go ab above like i said it, it it's above race it's above thing there there is a racial component there's a generational component which i'm very happy that you you, you brought up because i think that's actually even more comp than the racial but that's why i want to kind of take it out of just you know it's not just further black music yes r b we know where it comes from or you should know at least you know what i'm saying we know where it comes from but it's it's beyond that let me let me give you an example just to do it we're finishing jazz fest and um as you know one of my best friends uh, malika Tiro she uh, she was on the the snarky puppy record uh, incredible one. exactly that got the Grammy with Layla Hathaway right so um and then she went on to do book on anyway she she's I can't wait till you come on her podcast boo boo by the way so um yeah she does the show with snarky puppy and it's like her kind of Montreal homecoming you know what I mean? So it's beautiful, man. Like she put me up in the balcony. We're having a great time. Da, da, da. So after the show, you know, Michael Lee, she's like, I'm coming back in the tour bus, man. We'll chill, whatnot. And so I walk in and uh, I walk into the tour bus and me and Malika walk in and I hear this song from Tony, 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 like Raphael Sadiq. You know what I mean? 19, I mean, and shoo, you know you start getting like a little old when you hear a song and it kind of takes you back like to your childhood and memory. <laughs> it's like a four. Hey, yo, Tony, I was like, I think it was like, it's our anniversary. Well, no, um, it's like one of the most beautiful ballads, man. It's not Rain in Southern California. I can't believe I'm blanking on this right now. But anyway, Tony, Tony, Tony's catalog is too. I walk in and I'm just like, yo, who is playing this Tony, Tony, Tony track right now? And the white guitarist, Mike, gets up and he's just like, what you know about Tony, Tony, Tony? I'm like, what you know about Tony? And so we just sit down and we know, and Malika's like sitting and she's looking at us. Malika's from Guadeloupe. You know what I'm saying? So she wasn't born in North America. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 where she came from. So the music that was coming at her, and we always had these discussions about international and my childhood, how, how, how I raised. And she was like, yeah. because Where are you from? Originally? I'm born and raised in Washington, D.C. I'm originally from Senegal and Cape Verde. And then gotcha. I moved to Montreal. So that's, that's my story, you know? So, um... And Malika told me, she was like, yeah, because when you tell me about growing up in the States and R&B and black R&B and, and black radio and black music and, you know, and, and you make it, you know, it's like it's, it's like it's this real black culture thing. You know what I'm saying? And then, but I'm seeing Mike here, like kind of like he's the one that's playing it. And, and he looked at me, he was like, oh, Malika, he was like, do you know what this song means to me? This is me in San Francisco at the mall at 13 years old, holding pinky with my hopefully like soon to be girlfriend, writing a note. Will you go out with me? Yes, no, maybe. That's what this song means to me. I'm like, Manika, you walk into a mall, it just plays. It just is. R&B for me is like white rice. It's Dude. everywhere. I mean, but as soon as we get here, oh, 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 oh we're gonna ça groove. Oh, oh, on va trouver. We're gonna find every single adjective, but actually give it. We're gonna take every single thing from that actual music put it in other things pop edm electo da, 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 except calling it for what it is all right and all so right, that's right, where right. for me like <laughs> that's what i want to say that i find it that it's a it's it's a phenomenon you go to china and they're just like r and b you go to japan r and b you go to brazil and argentina r -R -N -B. like whatever you know what i'm saying like there is an equivalent but here and why is that? Do you find? Okay, okay, so well, hold you, on. Do you hold feel on. the phenomenon Let's, I'm talking about, right? So like we'll make it above race. We'll know? make it interesting, and uh, I'll take the counter argument. To Go that, for it. Okay, and just for the sake of like, <laughs> just having fun. Mm -hmm. But like, okay, so one one thing that I agree with you, a hundred percent. As soon as I land in LA and I take a Uber from LAX to my apartment, it's hip hop and R and B all the way on the radio, right? Mainstream radio. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, 100%, like mm -hmm. definitely. However, uh, and th th this is like me tr taking the counter argument to, 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 to yours. But like, um, you can't force people to listen to 
a style of music or, or another style of music. I, I get your point. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So your point is you walk into the mall, thing is playing. Uh, nobody asks to, to play it. It's just playing, mm -hmm. and that's part of the, of the culture. Mm -hmm. Right or wrong, it's not part of, of, of Quebec's culture. Quebec's culture is cowboy fringant. Quebec's culture is... Ah, uh, but... Okay, go on. <laughs> but everybody was blasting the Bruno Mars album to the top. And where did that album come from? New Jack Swing, when Bruno Mars won, the, okay, won, won, so won his album of the year, <laughs> so what, the who did, what did he thank? Babyface, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, and Teddy Riley. And all these people, and this guy, and, and this is blasted. Like, we're here at Moon Sun Studios, and we know what, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Moon Sun Studios, and, and we've been in corporate events. We've, we, we've done private events before. What is the majority of your repertoire in private events when you go and play a private event in Quebec? It's, it's usually stemmed from R&B. Oh, I might. You see what I'm saying? So for me, it's years. like, well, play it. it. It exists, but the term is not there. It's true. You get out of Montreal, truc, you know, Cowboy Fringon, yes, there's, there's the folk and there's a traditional but, okay, thing so of Quebec. But I, but I find that Quebec, when you play it and you go to a crowd, like for me, I remember I did a show on Les Plains d'Abraham and everybody was like, and it's just, they were grooving and it came and it just, it just is. But there's it a bigger, is, there's a know? bigger, there's a bigger, uh, not a bigger. Ooh. There's a different nuance here. Yes, go for it. I need to hear those nuances. People, um, m people think that Montreal is representative of Quebec, which it isn't. It is not. Yes, speak on it. So Montreal is first of all bilingual. Mm -hmm. uh, Montreal is multi multicultural, and it's beautiful and it's cool and whatever. Um, it's it's awesome. Uh, if you get out of Montreal, don't have to go that far. You can drive 30 minutes in any direction. What you'll find is white people that speak French. Facts. And I don't see anything wrong with that. That's just, you can't blame somebody for, 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 for their race and That's you can't blame somebody for their language. Of course. But we can't assume that these people that live uh, in Trois-Rivières, Lac Saint-Jean, Bas Saint-Laurent, mm -hmm. Uh, like the same things that people from a bilingual, multi multicultural city like. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so, and and so part of that is uh, accessibility. Yes. You know, it's like when you go to the cafe or whatever, the artist is going to play. Listen, we come from a singer-songwriter culture. Exactly. We don't come from a R and B background. If you go to Detroit, you have. From the 50s and on, or maybe 40s and on, you have a culture of jazz, of, and you know, that's true for a bunch of other cities New York, um, Philadelphia, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. like a bunch, a bunch of other cities. Uh, they have, like, you know, uh, a culture of music that, 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 that spans like whatever, 50, 70 years, mm -hmm. and that, that, that music. Is, is embedded in the lives of everyone that played baseball, mm -hmm. that played football, exactly. and that uh, played uh, basketball. In Quebec, our culture is singer-songwriter, played hockey, lived through winter. It's, it's just not the same thing. A thousand and percent. And so, so it's like from the 50s and on, uh, the, the songwriting wasn't R&B-based. The True. songwriting was folkier. Like, listen, if you listen to Harmonium, mm -hmm. Beau Dommage, it's like you go down like memory lane uh, and uh, whatever. Like, uh, the, I mean, there's, there's so many. Michel you know, Rivard. Diane Dufresne, yeah. Michel Rivard. None of these people are R&B based. True. Their writing is way more European. Indeed. It's way more lyric driven. Mm -hmm. um, it's not rhythm driven. And so I don't see anything wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. So so I, but then you can't you can't expect so so these people from the 50s and mm -hmm. on are the people that built TV stations, mm -hmm. they built whatever festivals, mm -hmm. they built um uh 
name it, like mm -hmm. radio stations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So they, they do what they know. Yep. Now, those people are all retiring. So I see this as a huge opportunity for the new people. That, because now, if you live in Trois-Rivières, if you lived in Trois-Rivières or in wherever back in the 90s, mm -hmm. you didn't have the internet, you exactly. didn't have... So what, what do you know? You know what's around you. Now a kid that grows up in Trois-Rivières, they know Drake, they know this weird band from Sweden, yep. and they know that they can buy something on Amazon is going to show up two days later or a day later yeah. at their doorstep. So the world is a much more open place, mm -hmm. it's a much larger place, and you might be in contact with more R&B. Thank you so much. <laughs> This is exactly what I wanted to hear. You really, I find, really described very well the demographic, the songwriting history over the last 50 years, the difference between Montreal and Quebec as that's versus Canada, and then the rest of the world, and why we find them, ourselves in this particular situation, which I'm not saying that, you know, I don't want to be like, you know, the, the old guy mad at the clouds, oh, I'm mm -hmm. me, say it. you know what I mean? It's not necessarily <laughs> that, but it is to kind of ring an alarm and to do these things, because for me, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing those kids from Jonquière, from Alma, from Trois-Rivières, from Sherbrooke, and whatever, and those kids are doing rhythm-based music now. Those kids Crazy. are doing popular music. Rap Keb has taken over. You know what I'm saying? And the way that Rab Keb has taken over, it took a little bit of time because of some of those, the, the things that you enumerated, and especially for the audience that's not from Quebec, that's not from Canada, I think you did that so perfectly, so I really want to thank you for showing that <laughs> phenomenon, but like you said, this is a grand opportunity, and this is actually one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast, so we can speak about what the real, what the reality of the situation is, not to get mad about it, it's not to get too frustrated, it's to say, hey, what is the actual, what are the facts? What's going on? And then what is the opportunity that we have here and that we can go? Because for me, when I see uh, groups like uh, Valère and Qualité Motel, shout out to my boys who really brought me like, you know, across Europe and stuff like that and, and cool, be some cool things. And, uh, you know, and all these other acts that are coming out, there's really some cool, amazing stuff. Uh, Les Louanges, for Les Louanges, that's, man, I met this dude, I did a podcast with him, with a DJ Gaillance, man. Bro, this dude, man, like, I mean, his melodies and top lines and groove, it's so soulful, man. And I'm seeing out of not just Montreal, Quebec, that there is an entire thing. And so what I'm telling to the industry, like, Dude, like, respect la disc, but it's not about just awards, you know what I'm saying? It's not, I'm not trying to hear it be for awards. This is, that's just a, a minute example. Me, I'm doing this podcast for the kids that are on the come up that are looking for an actual R&B platform, that are looking for a place where they can actually go do that. And, it's, and I see that it's starting to come. But, you know so what I mean? So I think if it doesn't exist, it's a huge opportunity to create it. And that's what I'm doing. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, I think that if you're right mm -hmm. and there's that many people that are interested in it which i'm sure there are yeah they'll come to the platform and then they'll you know because i'll give you another example just in, in where it's even generational you know i was part of a movie which is quebec's first urban dance film the the uh step up of quebec The, I, the you got served of Quebec. I think you know my buddy worked on that. Yeah. Like, what's, what was the name of the film? Sur called? le rythme. Yo, my shout out to Nico. Yeah. Nico! <laughs> yeah, but oui. Exactly. Yo. I, he's, he's one of my uh, close friends. Mm -hmm. I, I really love the dude. And, and so, yeah, you, know, you, you worked and on this that. Is, and, this is, and this is, I'm just saying facts. This is, with all due respect, I'm just saying facts. And this is how we got brought into the, uh, to this. And Mario Suvigny is, shout out to him too, is somebody who really brought me into the world of, of, of film and TV. You know what I mean? And uh, what was the situation? There was these dance scenes. And the dance scenes, and what they were replacing it by, they were replacing it with um, Rihanna and Eminem. Uh, you just stand here and watch me burn. That's all right, because I love the way you learn. Um, also, uh, Jay-Z, ain't no love in the heart of the city. Yo, all the Bobby be, Blue Bland. All must the, be so, so cool to have that voice you know, and be able it. to just <laughs> bust out. <laughs> like, yeah, I, was, I gotta let people know, you know what I'm saying? I gotta let them know what my day job is, you know what I'm saying? But like, yeah, like, those were the songs that they put up for us, and they're just like, we can't afford these songs. Est-ce que vous pouvez faire quelque chose comme ça? And it's like, okay, 
we're happy we're in the door we're seeing changes that you know what i'm saying be it people of minority and of different communities or that the genre and the culture because like i said i always bring it back to that dude from snarky puppy mike you know it's just part of the culture it just is that this is starting that the the, the, the page is going to turn and for me the way that I tell people is, if you go to the supermarket, in Quebec they'll always tell you, if you go to the supermarket, I love my two sections. I got my cheese section, I'm trying to stop on dairy, but the cheese is hard, man, I got French roots. It's really hard. And, and strawberries, you know, those are two things that I go for. And I always think about it. I live in Quebec, I'm here, like, you know, and it's like, acheter local, buy local. You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, instead of going for the, the, the Hamburg and the, from Switzerland or the, the, the Swiss cheese from France or whatever, yo, Quebec Swiss cheese is dope. <laughs> it's really good and it's even a bit more expensive. You know what? I'm gonna invest. You know, the, the strawberries, like, good. And it's a little more expensive, but you know what? It comes from here. So I put some on it. For me, I'm seeing the Rihanna and Eminem, but we don't have this thing, so can you guys reproduce? And, and you know, we're here producing, just trying to avoid getting sued, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, and that's like, real talk, you know? I'm not I'm gonna give y'all the real spit, and that's what it is. And, but for me, there's so much, they could have just taken a song that already exists. Boom. Like, you know, she wasn't here at the time, but Cali Technis, bam, put her song in a Quebec production. Ça vient d'ici, it comes from here. We did this everything around this that we did. So a lot of the times we say, hey, we don't want to imitate Americans, we don't want to imitate English, we don't want to do things here, we have to do certain things as local, but, and then it goes. So this podcast is too, to show, and to kind of shine a light on what that is, and right now, even at Quebec Television, my phone is starting to ring a little bit because, you know, it's, I'm seeing the change. I'm seeing that we want grooves, we want these type of things that are coming in, which is what our kids are listening to. You know what I'm saying? The kid in Trois-Rivières Trois right now is probably bumping a Victoria Monet right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, Hopefully. and it's like, yeah, exactly. So it's like, that's, and that's the change that's coming. And I think that we're like on the precipice of it. So that's why I'm just kind of trying to push it over the edge. You know what I'm saying? And do it with love because I understand exactly what the demographic is. You know what I mean? Bro, and even, you did even... that so well. And I want to thank you again because you just, you, you, you just, highlighted the root of everything oh man <laughs> my pleasure i mean i uh i i went on a u.s tour 2019 mm -hmm. prior to the pandemic mm -hmm. and uh you know even in the u.s where r&b is like the most important style of music mm -hmm. uh, r&b is not pop <laughs> it's like when people talk about pop what they mean is make an r&b record you know speak on it facts and but uh, if you if you tour the U.S., you'll see that man. I mean, it's it's um, yeah. There's there's it's a lot of uh, diversity between cities and mm -hmm. what they listen to, what they like, what they. So yeah, man. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I'm hopeful for 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 you and for Quebec and for everything uh, R&B wise. I think I think it's coming, man. And I think that it's it's because of people like you who, who are, are, are making these waves around the world, but who understand the importance of home and, and, and speaking on it. And, 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 you know, we met on Clubhouse and, and things like that, but being able to, to share the information. And that's what I want to do. And that's another reason why I'm here, y'all, is to be able to share this information. Because especially being here in Montreal and whatever, there's an information gap, there's a generational gap, there's different types of gaps that are going on here. And by having these platforms where we can actually give back, where we can share, I mean, this is the main reason why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for like that amazingly like talented 18 year old that's just like, yo, like I'm, I want to do R&B, like where, where this is, I'm just like, yo, you you have a culture here that's here to support you. You have mentors, we have people here. So I really want to thank you for coming through and for doing this, bro, like for real. So before we leave, I'm going to ask this question. And so you can talk to that 18 year old that's on the come up from RDP, from Jonquière, from Alma, from, yeah. from Little Burgundy, from wherever. And uh, you know, you really made that um, transition from session player, musician, to producer yes and you understand copyright you understand all of these type of things and this is something that i'm trying to do i'm trying to empower artists i want to empower musicians and let them know that you know you can become producers and be be more and go further than just your instrument you know what i'm saying like to have a whole understanding so what kind of advice would you give for an aspiring producer like from your hometown and also like an aspiring producer anywhere in the world like that can kind of that can go like what are some things that you know, some lessons that you learned along the way in your transition and in your journey 
that you could kind of like, you know, give some okay. free game to. Give, this is free game. This, I'm going to call this the free game segment. Free game segment. Free game by Pierre-Luc Rioux. Uh, free game. Okay. Something, there's an advice that uh, somebody gave me earlier on that completely changed my outlook on music and on making a living doing music. And he was a, a business person and he was not in the business of music, but he said, I looked at music and I realized one thing and the people that uh, emancipate from just the daily grind and that becomes successful in uh, you know modern terms, depending on what your de definition of success is, are content creators. And I wouldn't say that I've transitioned from session player to producer. I think I'm both because uh, I still do sessions. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, yes, you still do sessions. <laughs> I do a bunch. Yes, you, that, that, the new Justin Bieber album, go, go check it out. Uh, yeah, he's on that. <laughs> uh, but when I heard that, I'm like, okay, great. So I have to move from doing sessions, not owning uh, the copyright or the master recording or whatever to being a content creator and the, the thing that's amazing about the internet today is that you can accelerate your content for zero marginal cost you know you Ooh. can uh, do one mp3 or 10 million mp3s for the same marginal cost which is zero um, so become a content creator own something of that, that you make, even if it's a small portion. Uh, so first advice, being a content creator. Second advice, I would say specialize. So from my personal experience, I specialize in guitar playing. I became really obsessed with it. And then I got this opportunity. I was working at this label and I, I thought this artist needs Another record, another French record. I'm going to make it. I went to them and said, she needs another record. I'm going to make it. They said, you can do that? I said, yeah. And I didn't even know what an EQ was. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and, uh, and I couldn't technically do it, but I, I, I jumped in the pool and I did it. And I think advice to young women out there, there is a, a difference in the whatever, from what I've read in the science between male and female on risk taking. Uh, some men, m more men than women claim to take jobs that they're not qualified for. Uh, wow. Sheryl Sandberg wrote a book about it called Leaning In uh, or Lean In, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so as, as, as a you know young man, uh, somebody said, you can do that. I said, yes, it, it's apparent that young women would have said, uh, according to the data, I'm not saying that, uh, would have said, uh, I don't think I'm qualified for that. So I would give it the advice to young women to take jobs that you're not qualified for and learn on the, on the job and, and do it. I think there's not enough female producers. And... Uh, uh, yeah, female producers especially. I'm going to stop at that. I think there's not enough female, a bunch of other things but in music. Uh, but producers, there's very few. And there's the ones that I know are amazing. Amazing. So it's not for lack of talent. Uh, and I, maybe it's for, 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 for not jumping in the pool when um, even if you're not qualified. So Take 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 the leap, even if uh, when it's most scary to jump, that is when you jump. Oh my God! Um, so that's 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 so and then so by doing by being specialized in guitar and learning production, I was able to to to, to come at the junction of guitar playing and guitar production. Mm -hmm. And so now when I work with producers, I I come in with something different than just a guitar session there's a level of production in it. and then um so yeah two advices specialize 
jump in the pool. Uh, don't quit. I, I've seen so many, like I've worked with people that I thought were literally touched by God, mm. like genius level mm -hmm. uh, that have quit. Or, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Some of them have quit. And I might be ahead in my career compared to them, mm -hmm. uh, not because I'm more talented, just because I have a different work ethics. And, you know, it's like you can't compare just like one variable for another variable. It's like my life is composed of a million different experiences mm -hmm. um, that make me who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a sister who's uh, handicapped and she's the exp inspiration for, 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 for pretty much everything that I do because mm -hmm. I think she's incredibly courageous uh, because I think we're given, some of us are given the gift of um, health, uh, being born in a country with free speech. Mm. I, I, I saw on Twitter uh, yesterday, Jack Ma, he's the founder of Alibaba. Yes. So he's one of the richest men in the world. Yep. But I have free speech, and he doesn't. He, he spoke out against the government, and now he's being disappeared yeah, <laughs> by, like by 20, the government. 21 billion and being erased. Yeah. Um, so, so, so what I'm saying is we, we have the chance of being born in, in a country with free speech, and some of us are healthy. We can run. We have uh, our mental and physical abilities. I mean. Fucking crush it wake up in the morning go to bed late at night and whatever hours you have in the day try to kill it because you only have uh one life and please don't take it for granted amen thank you for that man thank you for that and especially thank you so much for saying specifically to women because we here at the give me the check podcast we are proponents for female producers there is a glaring lack a glaring lack of female producers just around the world, and especially in, in Canada. And R&B is, is such an amazing, amazing place to be able to come in and to do that. So thank you for saying that, because that is definitely something that's like a, a mantra of mine. You know, I'm like, how can, how can I represent and, and empower more female producers, not just to be in front of the camera, but to be on the boards, to be mixing, to be mastering, to be engineers, to be doing all of those different types of skill sets, you know what I'm saying, that have to do a bit more with copyright that actually empowers only ownership you know what I mean so shout out to all the women in the game that are doing that right now we see you we support you and just what you the game you gave for producers and whatnot because yeah some of that stuff really like hit me in the heart because some of the stuff is what I'm going through right now and the things Wait, that I'm what doing do you, mean by that? Uh, you know um, something that spoke to me is um, jumping and taking the risk even if you're not qualified you know I, I can take a whole other hour and talk about some of the um, the mental things that are in my head and the imposter syndrome that can kind of come around us. And with me, I've definitely been infected, uh, infected, yeah, infected by, you know, the imposter syndrome when it comes to my development as a producer. You know, oh, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't go to school for music or, or my theory's not as strong or I'm not, and it's like, fuck that, it's just excuses, man. You know what I mean? To, to, to put it in is just go do it. If you don't know something, wake up in the day, go do it. Wake up early, sleep late, do whatever you have to do and don't quit. And every skill can be developed. And just like the way you were talking about specialization, but being able to add skill sets on top of that. And, and that's really what I'm doing. And, and just that's my journey into becoming a, a producer because, you know, even now you see it, I saw the imposter syndrome because I have a hesitance to say, I'm a producer. Like, I'm a producer, you know what I'm saying? But it's still like there's a hesitancy in, in, in doing it. So just you speaking to that, that even if you're not, if you feel that you're not qualified, if you feel that you're not, there, take it, jump. You know what I mean? Like, it's. You know, it's, there's this uh, great author that I love called Nassim Taleb. Mm -hmm. And. He wrote a book, whatever. He, he has a concept of um, skin in the game. Yeah. He wrote a book called Skin in the Game. And his concept is, and it's a super interesting concept. Think of two doctors. Mm -hmm. You have the one doctor who's fucking slim, clean cut, uh, nicely dressed, immaculate, doctor looking person mm -hmm. and you have this other guy 
who's overweight, shirt unbuttoned, uh, shoes untied, hair all screwed up, and uh, has like a food stain. Mm -hmm. Which one do you think is the better doctor? And now the obvious choice is, well, that guy looks like a doctor, so he must be the better doctor. Mm -hmm. Nassim Taleb says, no, the better doctor is the fat guy because, and no fat shaming, sorry, it's just an example, mm -hmm. but uh, because he had to combat all the stigma of the good doctor Ooh. so that if he's here today on the same platform as this other guy, he must be way better because he, has to, he had to prove that he's at that level uh, uh, even if he doesn't fit the bill. And so my point being, uh, what was my point? <laughs> <laughs> No, but my point, but my point, no, my, my skin point, the skin in the game, exactly. So my point being is if you're a producer and you're, you have imposter syndrome, you put stuff out, mm. you let people judge it and they'll, some of them will shame you for it. Some of them will praise you for it. But one thing that's for sure is that once your name is out there, related to a product you have skin in the game so you you have agency over whatever happens now you can fold against you know the pressure or you can just move forward but the thing is if you have skin in the game you have now the urgency and the agency to do better than your last thing and to move forward because you can't example you can't do a podcast series so now you have skin in the game because you did one with me. So then you can't choke. <laughs> you have to do all the, the <laughs> into my soul right now. <laughs> you you need to do Woo! all these other all these other exactly. episodes. Um, so and and who cares if you feel like you're not qualified or you're not fitting the bill or you're Im the imposter because now you're in it. So you have to do it. See, I'm gonna, okay, you know what? I'm going to stop you right, guys. I'm going to go ahead and stop it right there because this segment is called Free Game, but if he keeps on going, he's going to start charging us. And I don't have the budget right now because I got some production costs coming at me and I can't be doing this right now. So, man, oh, one more time. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> me. That's that's gold, bro. That is All gold. Right. And Appreciate on it. behalf of of Montreal, on behalf of the music scene, on behalf of all the people that you came up with and you're crossing, we just want to, you know, give you your flowers because I know you got some on your shirt right now, but I'm going to give you some more. Thank you so <laughs> much for everything that you're doing. We're proud of you. We're behind you. We support you. You're opening doors for people, and we really appreciate you for that. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the producer of Child, Pierre. Luc Ryu. This is your boy Freddie V for the Give Me the Check podcast. Stay blessed and highly favored.